Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show, Science, Facts, and Fallacies, episode 247, I think. <laughs> We've been doing this too long, Liza. I'm here, as always, with uh, Dr. Liza Dunn, and uh, I'm really excited to be here. It's the end of the week. It's been a crazy week. There's lots going on in the world, lots to talk about. How are you? I'm well. I've had a crazy week, too. Yeah, I'm getting <laughs> married very soon, so I'm trying to put all that stuff together. Oh, my goodness. And- I've had a big trip to the Middle East coming up too, right now, or very, this weekend. So, wow. <laughs> yes, okay. it's going to be lively. That's crazy. I, when I got married uh, five, six years ago now, I had this thing happen where I, I had this obligation to invite people I didn't like that I was distantly related <laughs> to, and I knew they weren't going to come, but it's just the politics of the thing that you have to invite certain people. Are you experiencing this? Actually, not at all. <laughs> And th- therefore, I get to pick everybody that I want to come. So it's everybody who's invited is, is just one- wonderful. So it's going to be a very low key party, I think. That's, <laughs> we'll find that's, out. that's great. That's great. I love to hear it. You know, I, I mean, it's probably better that you only have to do it once, but if you have to do it twice, then at least that's, that's the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, and I should mention in, in passing, uh, as as most of you are aware, Dr. Kevin Folta has been on extended leave because he just had a daughter. Well, a few months ago, he had a daughter, and the break has been has been good for him. And so we've we've the three of us have chatted, and Liza has agreed to take over for the foreseeable future. So I'm very very excited to say, I can just call you my co-host for the for as long as this this goes on. It's great. Kevin's big shoes to fill, though. He's an yes. excellent co. He is. He is great. But I, but but you're great because you just stepped in and you do exactly what he did, which is answer all my questions and explain the confusing things that that uh, people like me want to understand. So, well, so with that little, little golf clap, welcome Liza officially to the to the show. And uh, let's jump right into these stories, and we'll get this get this knocked out for the week. So, first up, misleading guidance: why so many nutrition studies get the basic science so wrong. Next up, scientific one eighty. One tech multi millionaire's journey from evidence based advocate to COVID misinformation missionary. That's a tough phrase to say. That's about Steve Kirsch, which our, our co host here has some, some special insight into. Um, and then finally, confidence heuristic why humans are biologically programmed to follow self assured, poised people. These are really great, uh, really great topics, and they flow into each other nicely, I think. So, this first article we're talking about, this is by Dr. Chuck Dinnerstein at the American Council on Science and Health. Full disclosure, I do some work for ACSH and I co-host a podcast with Chuck. So not, not an unbiased observer in this, but I'm just going to try to explain what's going on. And then Liza, as the physician, can maybe dive in here. So basically, what they're looking at here in this study is um, old people. <clears throat> they're looking at the nutritional habits of older or elderly people, and they're trying to figure out how what you eat affects your biological age, which is not necessarily how old you are. So they're talking about, specifically, it's 1,800 people in Quebec, Canada, and they're looking at, um, it's it's the fancy word is non-consecutive 24-hour recalls of of dietary habits, right? So they're looking at what you eat in, in three days, but not exactly like, okay, over this three-day weekend, you ate such and such, right? It's just trying to, to get a sample of what these people eat on various days of their lives. And then they're looking at, and this is cool, Liza, you can talk about this too, but this is an, this is an epidemiological study, but they're actually looking at you know biological measurements. So they took, uh, they said 30 blood-based biomarkers that reflect five systems impact by aging. And so this is uh, oxygen transport, liver and kidney function, the ability to generate white blood cells from stem cells, which I think is an, a measure of immune function, micronutrient levels and lipid levels. So they're ba- right. This is a whole spread. They're trying to figure out like what you eat, how does it affect all these various systems? Um, and the, the key that the key thing that Chuck t- talks about here, Dr. Dinnerstein, excuse me, the key that he talks about here is that it's not a univariable dietary study. So with a lot of these that you'll look at, they'll say, how does eating high fructose corn syrup affect your risk of 
diabetes or heart disease or whatever, right? It's that specific association in isolation. And that's all they're really concerned about in this study. But here they're looking at how does eating one nutrient affect another nutrient, right? Do they have this kind of synergistic effect? Um, and then the different you know, f- uh, physical systems that they affect, right? So they're trying to get a holistic picture, which I think is good for a lot of these studies. Um, but his, his two basic takeaways are, uh, you know, your age is not just reflective of I'm 67 or I'm 35 or whatever, right? You actually have to look at what's going on under the hood, if you will. And then the, and I just said the other one, which is that nutrition is very, very complex. You don't just eat one thing and then that one thing has an, an impact. Maybe you eat that one thing and because you eat that, you eat other things as well. Right. So there's a whole complex mess of, you know, physiology going on here, Liza. So dive in here and give us some, some insight. I think one of the things that is characteristic of human beings is there has forever been a pursuit of the fountain of youth. (laughs) And this to me represents a little bit of that. And the fountain of youth is this, it's almost like a holy grail when it comes to um, trying to identify different things that are going to make you stay young and beautiful forever. Well, the truth is we're all born for a, with a terminal illness and life is a hundred percent fatal. <laughs> in the long run. <laughs> Some of us are more fortunate than others. Some people wind up living a very long time and aging well. And some people maybe don't live so long and don't age that well. So it's funny as a physician, you would in the emergency department, I would see people who would be, 35 and look like they were 60 and people who were 60 or 80 and look like they were in, you know, their forties. And it didn't have anything to do with just eating. It has to do with a food. Food is being perceived as medicine and the ties of food and nutrients to certain outcomes are, are very widely promoted and sometimes uh, promoted for financial reasons um, because people like to make money. Um, but but there the 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 the, 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 the association between food and longevity and certain kinds of food or certain kinds of nutrients and longevity is is speculative at best. We know that if you eat too, too, too much, the dose is a poison that, you know, you can get sick from too, too, too much. And we know that if there's too, too, too little, then you also have a problem um, because you have malnutrition. So, so the trick is to find the right balance. And what I think about this um, article is uh, um, I think the interpretation of the article I, is, is fantastic because it, it is about complexity. But I think the article itself, the scientific article itself, they are trying to put metrics around the art of medicine. And the art of medicine, which has been largely lost, is when you can sit down beside somebody at the bedside and think, um, you know, you don't look so well. And what are these things that make you not look so well? And it's, 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 it's one of the really important parts of medical training. So they're talking about, for example, they're, they're making a very, a very, very complex um, biomarker measurements that, and trying to make a ratio between the amount of protein and carbohydrates or lipids and, and carbohydrates and the macromolecules and, and make an association as to whether the outcomes are um, good for aging and then good for sort of metabolism or they're, they're, you know, so they've taken biological markers to evaluate that. Um, and the ultimate conclusion is, well, um, too much of a good thing is not so good and too little of a good thing is not so good. And we need to try to find the Goldilocks <laughs> <laughs> the just right um, part of, of this um, to make sure that to, to, before we can make claims that certain uh, nutrients can are certain, nu- certain nutrients, both micro and macro, can be beneficial to health. So we know that a little too little is not good, a little too much is not good. So let's sit, try for the happy medium. And they've made it very, very, very complicated. And, um, it's interesting, <laughs> but I don't think that, I don't think that they actually showed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, how do you put it diplomatically? They, they've took a very simple truth and they 
tricked it out with lots of <laughs> statistics and variables and this model and that model and mixed linear, linear effects and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, it just seems like don't overdo it. That that seems to be the best. Right. The one it's thing, like yeah, go rearranging ahead. deck chairs on the Titanic because we're all going down. <laughs> On a, on another uh, podcast, uh, Chuck put it this way. He said, nobody gets out alive. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and I think not to be cynical or, or, you know, dark about it, but I think if you realize that, you go, you know, we already know what the end game is. So let's just take a deep breath and, you know, understand that nothing you do is going to make you live forever. Or, you know, the, the one thing they said in the conclusion of the study, they said that, uh, our results advocate against the popular practice of eating to maximize or minimize certain nutrients. The dose response, as you were just referring to, is often U-shaped and highly dependent on context. Our physiology is often robust enough to tolerate relatively wide variation without much consequence. And it's, I think that's very beautifully written, and I think it has the uh, potential to piss everybody off, <laughs> no matter what you think about, you know, low carb or paleo or vegan or everyone's going to get mad at that statement. What do you think? And that's because it's truth. Yeah. Right. It's truth and truth. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't uh, make everybody happy. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very good. <laughs> I remember just to personalize this a little bit. I remember I lost a lot of weight years ago and I did it with a low carb diet. And because of that, I became a true believer, right? It, insulin, you had to control insulin. Don't eat your carbs, especially the, the sugary, high glycemic ones. And then over time, I started to realize, I'm like, oh, there's a lot going on there, right? I turned one dial. And as a result of that, I probably affected dozens or even more, you know, multiple variables biologically, right? And then I saw evidence that people were eating loads of white rice and fruit juice. It's called the, the Duke rice diet back in the day. Look this up. It's absurd. Um, but people, okay. people lost a bunch of, I forget the physician's name, but you could just go down to Duke University and go, hey, I want to do your, your rice diet. So they would book you into a room and he would put you on this absurd diet that was mostly carbohydrate and lots of it. And people lost over a hundred pounds in some cases. And so I started to see data, started to see data points like that. And I went, oh, okay, right. There's a lot going on here. So not everyone has to eat a steak every night. That's <laughs> all. No, they don't. No, they don't. <laughs> Did they keep the weight off? I th I think so. Yeah, there's been a couple of papers. And I think the guy was actually accused of, I don't want to know if it was abuse, but a har like he, he, he was rigorous, shall we say, with people to the point that some of them were like, dude, <laughs> you need to pump the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll look it up and link to it. But it's just a, a, just a you know one example of, the complexity we're talking about here. But this is great. I, I wish more people would read this. Uh, read Chuck's article, at least. And then maybe if you're yes, feeling... Yes, Chuck's article is wonderful. It's a great description of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he is great because he's a retired surgeon. So I feel like he's good at translating all the academic stuff into like, how do you interact with real people and how do you translate this to them? And does it apply to yeah. them? Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Uh, okay. But let's move on here. This is our, our next story. And this one was really interesting to read. So... Again, this one's called Scientific 180, One Tech Millionaire's Journey from Evidence-Based Advocate to COVID Misinformation Mis Missionary. And this is about uh, Steve Kirsch, who has become, I, I guess, a minor celebrity, Liza, is how we could put it, for... for say he's gotten uh, he's got a huge following. I'm going to yeah. look and check what his following is on Twitter. I'll tell okay. You right he's, in other <laughs> words, what I'm saying is he's not Kim Kardashian famous, but he's got like a true circle of millions of people that trust him when it comes to COVID vaccines and COVID therapies. And increasingly now, and very unfortunately, agriculture and pesticides, because I think it was Kevin, Kevin pointed this out that the, the COVID grift is, is starting to run out of uh, runway because the pandemic is winding down, hopefully. And so these these guys who have turned into, <laughs> you know, dispensers of uh, contrary scientific information are like, where can I go? Glyphosate. There we go. Right. And so here we here we are. <laughs> Not to mention the fact that um, in Joe Rogan's podcast, um, RFK Jr. Not only waxed lyrical about vaccines, but brought it into glyphosate as well. Yeah. yeah. It's all it's all connected, right? Every everything, it's a unified theory of everything. I think that that part is true when you're talking about Kennedy. Um 
But in any case, this story from MIT Technology Review, it's by Kat Ferguson. It's actually by 2021, so it is a bit dated. But I think it's interesting, and I think this is why GLP ran it, is it gives you some helpful background on this, this fellow. So Kirsch is actually a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and he's been very, very successful at this. I think his biggest... Um, success was a search engine called InfoSeek. So back in the day before Google was Google, this was sort of like a, I think it was like a highly specialized search engine and he made a lot of money from from developing it. He, I think, also was very important for developing the mouse. Yeah, so the, I, I don't know all the details because I, I don't follow yeah. Silicon Valley very closely. I'm not all that interested in it, to be honest. But yeah. I think the point is, is like he's developed a lot of these projects that have turned into useful products. And as a result, he's been he's made a lot of money from that. Uh, and we'll get back to why that's important in a second. But the article goes on and says that by March 2020, um, he started, because everyone's talking about the pandemic, so he started, it seems like with a good idea, he took a lot of his money and he devoted it to finding COVID treatments. And there was the, there was the vaccine development and there were new drugs that were being researched, but he said, let's look at FDA approved stuff and let's do clinical trials and figure out if any of those work because they're already approved. So all you need to do is show that it's, you have basically you have lots of uh, safety data. You just need to show that it works uh, you know, against this novel virus and maybe you're off and running here. So he founded what's called uh, the COVID-19 Early Treatment Fund and he put a million bucks into this. And he brought in a bunch of other investors. Elon Musk was one of them that contributed to this. And then uh, importantly, he brought in some very high profile scientists who are, who are experts in drug development to advise him on this. And I think it was through 2021, at least the date of this article, which was the fall of 2021, he put four and a half million dollars into testing all of these, these drugs that are already on the market, already approved. Um, but what's interesting and what where things seem to take a turn is that Kirsch, for whatever reason, one reason or another, he started to hone in on the treatments that didn't work for one reason or another, right? The, the, the clinical data that his research or the research he funded generated, he said, no, 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 you, can't, you, you, know, you forgot to carry one or, you know, the study was poorly designed. And first, the first one was hydroxychloroquine. And then another one was an antidepressant. It's called uh, fluvoxamine, I think. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he, for whatever reason, he went on a tear and started to say, no, 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 they're developing vaccines and new drugs because NIH wants these big pharma companies to make money. Uh, we have all these treatments and we could end the thing yesterday if people would just take this and they don't want you to know that. And that became the narrative that he's, he's very popular for. So it, it's very interesting developments. There's a lot of angles here. And I think, and without being condescending or, or, or sassy or anything, I think this gives you good insight into why he is the way he is. But you've actually debated him. So I'm very curious to hear, hear what you say here. Yeah. So it all started with Twitter Spaces in uh, December of 2022 when um, the Fauci files were released. And those were the, dis this, the discussion of emails that were between Fauci and very other, various other um, people at NIH and, um, and researchers around the, the country. Um, and so with that went a, a live discussion of what may or may not have transpired um, at the CDC and NIH and so a lot of people were at this particular Twitter space, which is a live discussion with several panelists who were evaluating what the email said and discussing the emails. So instead of getting FOIA'd, um, Elon Musk decided to release all of the emails between Twitter and the government and Twitter and a, a whole bunch of different people um, to five reporters in in order to main, maintain transparency. And so the Fauci files was one of those sets. And I was concerned because I've been very involved at my company about um, talking to people who are worried about vaccines um, in general, and then the COVID vaccine in, in particular. Um, and so I started listening to this space. And on this space, the host, Mario Nafal, 
uh, said, are there any doctors? There was a whole big, huge sort of anti-vaccine discussion and how this was, you know, uh, these were terrible for people and, and pharma and the government and everybody was hiding information. And there were so there was a whole clear anti-vaccine bent. Now, a lot of these people had not started out anti-vaccine, but they felt like their questions hadn't been answered. And when they raised questions on social media, um, they were shut down. Um, and so like we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, when you have scientists who are really good at science and somebody who is a skeptic or doubts it, one of the things that scientists have done is they've become impatient and can be and can be bullies. And so a lot of these people were very upset because they thought that the governmental policies that were implemented were not justified. They were very upset because they thought that the um, their children were harmed. Um, and then they were very upset because they felt like they had been completely shut out of the discussion with questions. Um, and so the, dis the tone of the discussion on the, the panel was they were angry, they were frustrated, and they had they felt like they had not been heard. So Mario said, is there anybody in the audience that's a doctor that's pro-vaccine that could come up? <laughs> so I went and boy, was that a lively discussion. But literally hundreds of thousands of people listened to it. And um, I think it was really, really important. And I think that um, uh, people have not engaged on this platform and have not had, they've been in their echo chambers, but they've not engaged in this platform. So the next day, um, Mario asked me if I would debate Steve Kirsch and I'd never heard of Steve Kirsch. And so I said, sure. <laughs> and next thing I know, I'm on Twitter and they're hosting a Twitter space with my name on it without me. <laughs> and so... I show up and I'm like, hi, uh, I didn't know that we were having this space. And he's like, oh, okay, can you read my sub stack and answer my questions? And it turns out there are like 150 questions on this sub stack. I'm like, I might have to take a minute or two <laughs> to read it. So anyway, we came back an hour. I had 15, min 15, 20 minutes to read it. And we came back and we debated for an hour. And um, needless to say, I, 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 told him that I wanted it to be a cordial interaction. And it actually was, but I gained myself a whole bunch of trolls on Twitter who came after me for being very, very, um, for being pro-vaccine. Um, and so, uh, so that's, that's been the legacy of that discussion, but he, um, is, is very focused on hydroxychloroquine. He's very focused on, you know, um, alternative, methods of treating these and he's got his own perspective on whether or not the, the um vaccine the covid vaccine is is uh safe efficacious and kept people out of the hospital and he very vehemently thinks that um it it, ha it isn't and that big pharma is hiding data um he's thinking that uh, data is being suppressed he's also thinking that um, these alternative methods of treatment work even though there are multiple studies that demonstrate that they don't um so uh, uh he's yeah he's he is very very focused and has actually started a super PAC for rfk jr mm. presidential campaign oh boy Mm -hmm. Um, I, well, first of all, thank you for interacting with him because I, you told me about it and I didn't know about it and I watched it and there was some odd things going on. The first I noticed is that you came on and you said, he said, you know, thank you for doing this. And people just call me stupid and wander away. And you said, yeah, I, I don't think that's right. People have been in medicine. You said people have been condescending and rude and even bullies. And all he could say to that was, well, yeah. You know, thank you for acknowledging that, which was great. So right off the bat, you show up to like, hey, I work for a pharmaceutical company. I'm a doctor and sorry. <laughs> so I think I think that set a good tone. And then as the discussion went on, he kept trying to do like get you in a gotcha moment. So he would set up a question and he would go and and you're like, well, let's back up because your question is stacked. And that was that was frustrating, and and I don't know if it was transparent to other people. I, I assume it was to at least some, but he didn't come off well because it came off like I'm trying to get 
a, a 12 second clip of you that I can, you know, blow up on Twitter. Right. You court against a pharmaceutical company. Right, right, right. So, so in other words, and you didn't fall for that. You're like, well, let's go back to the clinical trial and here's what happened and here's what they're looking at and here's the number. Right. So even though you weren't like thoroughly researched, you're skilled enough and you're an expert enough to know, Hey, here's what's going on. So that I think that came off well. But then the other thing that I found really frustrating about him is that he kept telling, like you would, you would say, you know, vaccines work by this mechanism, just to be sure that people were following the conversation. And he would say, no, 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 no. Treat me like I'm your peer and stop trying to explain to people what a vaccine is. And, and I was like, why are you doing that? Because the whole point of this, the whole point of these discussions, according to you and your cohorts is let's get the, the facts out to people. But, <laughs> but he was trying to very carefully control the flow of information, even between the two of you. And I think the fact that you were there and you were just answering questions really exposed his shenanigans. Anyways, keep going. Yeah, so no, it was really interesting because he kept on talking about VAERS, which yeah. is the you know the reporting system that people can call in for um, vaccine injuries. But it's not even that; it's a self-reporting system, and so you have people reporting on other people who may or may not have had an adverse outcome. Steve has actually put together his own database where he makes claim where people can report what they bill to be vaccine injuries and vaccine related deaths is what they claim, right? He's included in those reports, um, somebody dying from falling down the stairs. Um, he's included in those reports, you know, people who presented with advanced cancers, they had advanced cancer prior to getting vaccinated. Um, and they subsequently died of that cancer. They probably, you know, were on chemotherapy and things like that. And, and so, um, they could, they, they should have gotten a vaccine because they're, you're trying to protect them from this very, very, um, bad disease. Right. And so he's got all sorts of, um, uh, reports in this database that are questionable um, at best, but he uh, claims that his database is is a you know a reliable thing to go to, um, and he has promoted it far and wide, um, and has made huge claims about uh, pharmaceutical companies and things like that, which I think are is really unfortunate. And I'd actually like to see. I wish I could see some of the um, pharmaceutical uh, industry and and, you know, people who physicians come up to these spaces. My last space that I was on two Sundays ago um, had 1.4 million people listening to it. Um, and I was one of the very few pro-vaccine doctors on that space. Um, and I would love to have more people on, the, on spaces like that to defend science. And this is not just for vaccines. This is, these spaces have really become um, an avenue for mainstream media and really important, lively discussion about a whole variety of different topics. And there's not enough science content out there. So I'd love to see more people from with a scientific background coming and countering some of these claims. The, the space that I was on had um, Dr. Robert Malone on it. Um, and he wound up leaving the space after I joined. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. So I've, I've countered Dr. Malone and I've countered um, Dr. McCullough. Um, and so I think that there need to be more people who can help dispel some of these. Dr. McCullough is selling supplements on um, the internet. Um, he says, you know, he's the most published this and he's the most published that and he's a distinguished cardiologist and he is selling um, a supplement that's supposed to dissolve spike protein and it's a <laughs> over-the-counter thrombolytic and a thrombolytic is a kind of medicine that you use when you're having a heart attack or a stroke. So you've got a blood clot cutting off the blood supply to your, in your coronary artery or in one of the vessels in your brain and it, it the tissue dies around it because you can't get blood to it so you give what we call a thrombolytic a clot buster uh, to to dissolve those clots one of the side effects of a thrombolytic medication is big head bleeds or big gi bleeds so i asked has anybody ever done a randomized double blind 
controlled placebo controlled study on your over the counter thrombolytic. He was very quiet about it. I didn't actually say on space that it was his, but he knew what I was talking about. Yeah. Um, so he, he got very quiet and didn't talk for much of the space after that. And Robert Malone didn't want to debate me because I'm an ER doctor. And then he realized that I'm also a medical toxicologist, at which point <laughs> he decided that he wanted to leave. So he did. But there, there, there were 1.4 million people listened to that. Um, and I think it's important to be polite. I think it's important to um, be uh, reasonable um, and be open to people's questions because there are general questions out there. Um, and I think it's important to engage with people who disagree with you. It's, it's important. And I think a lot of their uh, power as communicators comes from the prestige that they build up around themselves. So for like from Malone and McCullough, it's we're leading experts in our fields and we invented the technology that we now say is dangerous, right? That's, that's why they appeal to people. So if someone you like you goes into that that forum and just pops that bubble, all of, all of a sudden you have a real dialogue, and they really have to. They have know, to defend them, right? right? They have, and you, and they don't have to. You don't have to be rude to do that. I, and I thought it was really important to set the stage with Steve because there are so many people in his um, circle that can be really rude and dox people and do, do all sorts of you know, go really go after people. And I think that that is not a healthy way of debating. So um, I think that it's important to be polite. It's interesting though, you know, I, I was reading this article, uh, Wash U took, it did the fluvoxamine research, is doing the fluvoxamine research. So that's my alma mater, right? Um, and Steve Kirsch pay, gave them, I want to say half a million dollars to do it um, mm. somewhere around there. So so institutions doing are, are really trying to, to see if there's validity to um, these claims and, you know, that, that medicines work. We're all in this together. We're all in this, um, you know, epidemic together. We all have families and friends and we've been impacted by this, right? So Wash U Department of Psychiatry actually has doing the research to see if fluvoxamine works. Um, and there's some some suggestion that it might um, help decrease the inflammatory cascade and things like that. Um, and, but it, it's not definitive yet. And um, I think if the vaccine is not one of these routine SSRIs that people use um, and an SSRI is a serotonin um, reuptake inhibitor, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So what it does, it, it, serotonin is the neurotransmitter in your brain that modulates mood. And, and so it's useful if you've got, if you've got sort of a, the theory is that if you've got a deficiency of serotonin floating around between your synapses for communicating, um, the nerves communicating to each other, you, you tend to be a little bit more depressed. So people take serotonin reuptake inhibitors to keep, increase the serotonin concentrations in the brain and it, it modulates mood. Well, this particular one is actually used for OCD. So obsessive compulsive disorder is not really used for um, depression. Um, and I think it's very interesting that, um, that it's uh, being, the way they're looking at it, it's an interesting study. I don't know what they're ultimate gonna, ultimately gonna conclude. I think it probably doesn't have great benefit in COVID. A lot of people who are out there say, well, I gave hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, um, a fluvoxamine, and my patient survived. Well, most people who test positive for COVID are going to get a cold. So it's going to be very likely that this patient's going to survive either way. So the odds of them going to the hospital or the odds of them um, getting very sick are slim unless they're at risk, right? So the natural order of things is that if you give all these medicines, they're going to get better anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so to make that association, make that jump that these medicines are what kept them out of the hospital is spurious. And I think that that's what people are, are claiming. And so I think that the jury is still out on uh, fluvoxamine. They're still doing the work on it. There, um, I think that the, uh, the, and I, and I don't think it's very convincing, but, and that's the latest study, stuff I've seen. I haven't seen 
flu vaccinated very recently, but th as, as the last time I looked at it, I, the, the jury was still out. So um, I think that there's no benefit to hydroxychloroquine and I think there's no benefit to ivermectin. And um, I think that there's a mechanistic way that it could decrease inflammation and in the, in the entry of the, the SARS COVID virus into the cells for infection, but it doesn't pan out. Now, where I stand on hydroxychloroquine is that first do no harm. It's got a narrow therapeutic window and potential for significant side effects like blindness. So I prefer, I would not encourage people to take that, right? Um, it, to, it, to prevent something that's largely going to be a cold, um, unless you're, unless you are susceptible to COVID mm -hmm. for ivermectin, um, it really is a benign drug. It's, it's not going to hurt anybody. It's, it's not going to help in my opinion, but it's not going to hurt anybody. So if have at it, we, the people take homeopathic medicines, they take, they take <laughs> medicines off label all the time. Fine. I don't care if they do. I it's one ivermectin. If it makes them feel better, then fine. I'm not going to say that it works. If you want to spend your money on it, I don't care. I got the chloroquine I care about. And fluvoxamine's got a side effect profile that's not super. Um, and so I don't think it's, I think it's going to be marginal at best. Um, and Steve is very obsessive about things. Maybe he'd benefit from some. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, I hope that gets clipped and goes viral. That'd be awesome. Um, in, in, in all seriousness, though, I think, as I said before, you explaining these things is really important, especially to his audience, because, and they get into this in the, in the MIT article, is that as an entrepreneur, and I've worked for a handful of people like him, and mm -hmm. they're very smart, they're very driven, and they succeed often in big ways, right? So you, yeah. a, lot, a lot of failures big success that launches a company. And I think because of that experience, and again, this is armchair psychology. I could be full of crap. I don't know. <laughs> but what I, what I see in him from my experience in the working world is he has been proven right despite the odds, right? As an entrepreneur, your job is to upset the natural order of things and come up with a new product or a new service. And he's been good at that. So I think that really drives him to say, okay, yeah, everyone says you need this mRNA vaccine, but there's this other drug that no one's talking about. I'm gonna, you know, throw my my support behind that. It's useful to people that are interacting with him to understand that. Because if you read lots of these fact checkers and all of these people who have made it their job to combat misinformation, I hate that word incidentally, but they've they've sort of made it like my mission is to fight, you know, pseudoscience or whatever. They sort of start with the premise that, well, all the smart people are on my side. Everyone over there is an idiot, and they just don't like science. That's the extent of their analysis of who they're up against. And I think that sets you up to lose any discussion you go into to fail to convince people. Whereas if you can start with, oh, he has a history of challenging the consensus on this or that topic, and he's won. So if you understand that that's how he's approaching the issue, I think you can... Uh, have a better chance at convincing his audience if yes. you understand where you know where the where the game is set up at. Yes, and he's very smart. I, I, the people underestimate him. He's very smart, and I think that when people have scientific disagreements, they um, they will put people into categories. I, the, the, this circle of people really despises the term anti vaxxers They think that it's it's a uh, it's pejorative towards them. So in order to engage, you, you don't come at it from, I'm smarter than you are. I, I'm an authority on this and, and you aren't. And the biggest mistake that was made was suppressing the conversation mm -hmm. because the conversation was happening in circles around these people regardless. And to not, not engage them I think really amplified the problem, really amplified the problem. Um, and it's, it's going to take, it's going to take time to rebuild trust, um, you know, in, in science because, uh, because of the way COVID was managed. There was a, you just reminded me of this. There's a study out in uh, May, 2021. It was from, I think it was actually from MIT, but they were looking. They were looking at how <clears throat> COVID skeptics is the term they use. So people like Kirsch, people who are against masks and vaccines and so forth. 
they were looking at how these people uh, deal with data. And what they found, and I don't think you'll find this surprising, the authors were surprised by it, was these people are really good statist statisticians in some cases, right? They know how to dissect this data. They know what a p-value is. They know how to look at your results in a paper and critique them. And okay. I think that, again, that's very helpful for people out in the science communication world to understand is you're up against people who are not going to be stumped by you citing a study. They're going to go look at the paper and go, well, what about, you know, table 2.5, right? You have to be ready for that. But then the, the and I wrote about this back, back when the study came out, the, the, the conclusion of the paper was, you know, these people are just, some of them are probably secretly racist and some of them have a lot in common with the Young Earth Creation Movement. And, you know, so you have to understand that they're just going to torture data. It's like, no, man, that's not, you know, you're really that's smart. Not. You have way more letters after your name than I have. But that's just an idiotic conclusion to draw from your results, right? These people are out to prove that you are a clown, that you are up to no good. And when you sit there up in your ivory tower and you just, oh, oh, oh it's like you, yeah. you come off so awful as, as all. And I don't it's think, yeah. When some of these, some of the people who disagree with you are from the ivory tower too, and full professors in the ivory tower. So right. you, you, if, if you can't have a civil debate with them on the merits of the actual science, as opposed to labeling them as, uh, you know, flat earthers or, you know, whatever label you want to put on them, you are really, the public has no way of discerning what's true and what's not. But what they can see is they can see people being condescending and bullying. And then they, and that really gets the public upset, right? They, they don't want to see if they've got two eminent people in the same space that have the same credentials that are having a disagreement and they start <laughs> One starts being like, you can't talk. Yeah. The public's like, well, why can't they talk? Right. And what, what makes, what gave you that authority? So I think that it's really destructive the way it's been handled. Yeah. Um, so I, I looked it up. That study I was talking about, they compared anti masking advocates to critics of evolution. <laughs> they, uh, yeah. They said, they said their simultaneous appropriation of scientific rhetoric and rejection of scientific authority also reflects long-standing strategies of Christian fundamentalists seeking to challenge the secular, the secularist threat of evolutionary biology. And they also compared anti-maskers to Tea Party activists angry at a quote, and this is from the study, a federal system ruled by liberal elites who pander to the interests of ethnic and religious minorities. So in other words... Uh, skeptics of the COVID response are Republicans who are secretly racist. It's it's just the most asinine analysis I can I can. That is yeah, <laughs> and and, and it's, it's, I love how the Tea Party's painted as you know a bunch of militias, right? It's a bunch of grannies who didn't want their taxpayer money spent is what the Tea Party was. Don't spend my money that way. Um, so so long and short is yes, I think that I, if you. That is really at the root of what, you know, what divided the country. And I think it drove, it drove a lot of people who are normally moderate to, into the opposite camp. Yeah. It's incidentally, and, and I'm a big fan of science-based medicine most of the time, but David Gorski saw this article I wrote about this study. And it's like, oh, the pharma shills got the wrong conclusion. It's like, dude, you're just, it's like you are illustrating why I wrote this story. It's because you're so... <laughs> You're just so oblivious. Anyways, all right. Let's, I, this that's, is, I mean, that, that people say that to me all the time. You're a pharma shell. Well, I work for the ag. Oh, right. well, you're 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 a big ag shell. Ah, Monsanto, well, Monsanto. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I'm like, okay, let, uh, fine. I, yeah, that's disclosed. I work in ag. I work for a company. Can we talk about the science? And yeah. then, then, then they go and kind of listen a little bit. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Okay. We're going to stay on the same theme. I'm going to move on so I don't stop pounding my table in, in rage. But um, <laughs> th this final story we're talking about, this is from uh, the BBC Science Focus. And this is by uh, a journalist named Dean Burnett. And he's talking here. Well, th let me just tell you this, the title. So he says, the confidence heuristic why humans are biologically programmed to follow self-assured, poised people. So the confidence heuristic in essence, is that when two or more people are involved in a decision-making process where they know different things, confidently expressed arguments are perceived as convey conveying better information 
which determines the decision. So basically, you're just wired biologically to see a confident person as most likely correct. And I'm, you've probably heard this, everybody, but the, but the gist is that through, through our evolutionary history, or even in more recent times, right? If you know someone's standing on the wall of the city and they go, there's an army coming to kill us, get your swords and shields, it's time to throw down, right? That guy is going to be looked at as the most confident monkey in the room, so to speak, right? He's the one we're all going to follow, whereas the guy cowering in the corner, weeping in fear, Right. I think just saying that you go, that's gross. I'm not going to, right. It just, it's repulsive, I think. So, but that's, that's the basic, the basis of the story. And there's more commentary we can get into, but that's, that's the starting point. And, and I think, and I'm sure you will get to this too. This has profound impacts for how society understands science and the people we listen to when it comes to those topics. So what, what did you think? Well, so I, this article reminded me of a saying about surgeons sometimes wrong, but never in doubt. (laughs) That's a common saying about surgeons, but I'd like to cap that with something. Um, Do you know who Atul Gawande is? No. He's a surgeon and he's a, he's a medical writer. And I'm going to read a quote of his that I think is really, really um, interesting that ties into this. So he says, there's a saying about surgeons meant as a reproof, sometimes wrong, never in doubt, but this seemed to me their strength. Each day, surgeons are faced with uncertainties. Uh, And and information is inadequate. The science is ambiguous. One's knowledge and abilities are never perfect. Even uh, with the simplest operation, it cannot be taken for granted that a patient will come through better off or even alive. Standing at the table my first time, I wondered how the surgeon knew that all uh, he would do this patient the way. I wonder how the surgeon knew that he would do this patient good, that all the steps would go as planned, that the bleeding would be controlled and the infection would not take hold and organs would not be injured. He didn't, of course, but he still cut. Yeah. And that's the point is you can have the opposite extreme is paralysis, analysis paralysis, right? Every little thing we've got to take into account. And before you know it, you can't do anything. And that's where the precautionary principle comes in. Mm-hmm. Because it, because you're so afraid of every possible tiny outcome that you actually prevent um, pe- people from doing good things and innovating more um, or, you know, uh, making things better for people um, because you're so suspicious. So th- these are two kind of this this has got to stay in balance once again moderation is the key if you've got people who go you've got lemmings that will run off a cliff because <laughs> <laughs> here's a very confident lemming um and then you've got people who can't who are absolutely paralyzed by fear so you've got to you got to have a healthy dose of you know uh, suspicion when somebody's confidently saying something um not suspicion but it's, it's healthy skepticism yeah there's been a lot of interesting research, and it's all psychology, so it's a little loosey goosey. But I think some of the results um, are probably valid. And one one experiment I remember, they put uh, this young guy, early twenties. He's not impressive physically, let's say, right? Very skinny, very small, not not imposing. And they painted a box on the floor of this mall, and they had him stand right in front of the box. And as people walk through it, he was supposed to say, "Get out of my box." So the first time he goes, get out of my box. And, you know, he's breaking eye contact. He's like, excuse me, please get out of my box. Everybody ignores him. And then the next time around, they said, do the same thing, but shout it as as angrily as you can. So he goes, get out of my box. And all of a sudden you see the people like, whoa, whoa, I'm sorry. You, right. And all it took, right. Nothing changed about him. All that ch- changed was the volume and the pitch of his voice. And you could see as he kept doing that, he got more confident and more aggressive. And part of that, I think, is because he's getting that response from people. And I yeah, that's go ahead. Just just one experiment. So this is what so in emergency medicine training, one of the things that people have to learn how to do is to recognize an emergency and get people to stop standing on the sidelines. Yeah. So 
it's very common for people to see, a, you know, a train wreck in motion, right, in terms of an emergency developing. And they'll all stand there waiting for somebody else to do something, yeah. right? So you have to get trained in this mindset. So, uh, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, um, I, w- I, we were, I was eating with my family at a restaurant. And I heard somebody yell, oh, my God, he's choking, right? And this whole group of people standing there watching this guy choke. <laughs> and, you know, despite all the signs, you know, talking about how to do the Heimlich maneuver and everything like that. So I went racing over him, like trying to do the Heimlich, but he was a really tall guy and I couldn't get, I was really short. So I looked at the waitress next to me. I'm like, you're tall, do this. And she did. And the guy, the guy was fine, but he would have choked to, to death if, if somebody yeah. hadn't, you know, because people just go, oh, somebody else is going to do it. So that's one of the trainings and that, that you have to you have to sort of take charge and um, not in a negative way or a real bossy way. But if, if you don't, if you're not assertive, you need to be assertive mm-hmm. um, in order to make sure that people get, have good outcomes. Yes. Another, another way this is, I think, directly relevant to our discussions about anti-science people, whatever you want to call them, skeptics, getting mm-hmm. more prominent in the, in the discussion a couple of weeks ago, RFK Jr. was on Twitter and I'm, he posted a video of himself doing push-ups shirtless. And the caption underneath was, getting ready for my debates with President Biden. <laughs> and I just, I saw it and I laughed because on, on one level, I know exactly what he's doing, which is like, I'm the burly, strong, manly man, and I'm ready to fight this, this frail old man who d- shouldn't be who president anymore. Right. right. <laughs> Right, right. Dog face pony soldiers and, you know, I fall asleep, right? It's very, you know, it's it was funny to me because because on one level, you're like, okay, politics is just so ridiculous. You know, like this is what we've resorted to. It's no longer about I'm the better statesman and my policy on tax. It's like, we're just so far past that. Nobody cares anymore. Who can That's do more right. push-ups, right? That's... <laughs> it's a spectacle. But at the same time, and I noticed this in myself, and maybe I'll get criticized for this, is I saw that and I went, you know, that's kind of badass, right? Like, I can't stand anything <laughs> about this guy. I disagree with him on almost everything, especially the issues that we talk about and that I really care about. But seeing him do that, I was like, you know, he's kind of like that cool uncle at the family reunion that'll sneak you a beer and talk to you about the <laughs> Illuminati, right? He almost seems like this... Right. He's just this approachable, friendly old guy who can do push ups. And I just thought it was funny that that, even in me, that elicited that kind of like, some yeah. admiration. And yeah. well, that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to inspire. He's, he's, he's a good litigator, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he knows how to get people sway juries, right? He's, you know, he's a, that's another person who a lot of people underestimate. They're like, oh, he's so dumb. Ah, <laughs> no. no, that's a mistake. That's a, but, you know, it, people do this kind of stuff all the time in terms of not just people. So I had a Twitter conversation yesterday with somebody who was saying, talking very authoritatively about Terminator seeds and GMOs. I'm like, mm-hmm. those are not on the market. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> no, we're not trying. We're, there's there's a whole, and he, he disagreed with me and it was fine, but he was, he, thought he had information that he did not have. So that's kind of, you can have the Dunning-Kruger effect in anybody. And um, the article was, uh, an article that I read, and I think it was related to this one, it was saying that the Dunning-Kruger effect um, really may be a measure of, you know, um, intelligence. And I don't think so at all. I think you can have very intelligent people mm-hmm. be o- overestimate sure. their knowledge um, and their expertise without having that expertise. I'm sure it happens to a certain degree in everybody, but once again, physicians really think because that they have a good handle on what happens in the agricultural world. And it, and and I think that they are concerned about patients and patients well-being and health and things like that. So they weigh in very authoritatively about that. Um, And that's like, that would be like farmers weighing in very authoritatively about medicine or vaccines. And that's what physicians are dealing with right now. Physicians are realizing that, that they're like, well, why don't you believe the science? Well, it's kind of like because medicine became Monsanto. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you've got people who are questioning your science based on their perceptions, right? So 
It's not just, it's not just it, non MDs think that they're friends and, 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 uh, you know, Facebook, uh, circles can replace years of bedside life experience. Um, and, and, you know, real incredible, a huge amount of training, right. Um, they think, and I, it's interesting. I also get in discussions with some of my non-medical friends who tell me very authoritatively about things that they know work. And some, some of them are, you know, homeopathic and, you know, alternative medicine things. And I'm like, you know, maybe not so much. And then they ex- explain to me um, how, how these medicines work. And, <laughs> and even though they know I'm a physician and a medical toxicologist with a lot of expertise in pharmacology, they, they will very authoritatively tell me that I'm wrong. So I think that's human nature. And so the trick is to figure out once again, how to stay in the middle and and achieve the best outcome that you can. Yeah, yeah. Just um, I don't I don't know how to put it. It's just be a source of trusted advice. You know, be approachable and answer people's questions and interact with them without being a jerk. And that is really hard, by the way. I'm not I'm not trying to tell everyone that I have figured out. You know, um, I had the opportunity to go on the Dr. Phil show last year to discuss something I had written, and. It was like, it's nerve wracking to be on TV, but it's really hard to be nice to people who you know are lying through their teeth, right? I know like <laughs> the people I'm across from, they're probably okay people, but I know what you're saying is not only wrong, you you are telling people to do things that will harm them long-term, right? So it's really, yes. it's really easy to fall into like, well, actually, let me tell you about the dose response. Like you can fall into that. It's hard, you know? So I, I guess maybe that's what we'll end on is that, it's not easy. It's this is sales is what we're doing basically, and that's a hard thing to do. So, you know, I don't fault fault anybody in the sciences or in, in any field for struggling to communicate this really yes. complex material to to average people. It's hard to do. And I think if you keep your eye on what is truth, what what do I know is true? Yeah. Um. And and um, first do no harm. If those are your that like your guide guide lines or you know your north star you will be much more successful at um getting people to understand um how important things uh, you know science and sticking with sciences um and really really so yeah the truth tell the truth yeah as best you can and um it's hard to do because everybody believes things that are going to be wrong ultimately Mm-hmm. And so it's hard to, to be humble enough to go, I, I might be wrong on this, right? Because yep. being right is fun. It, it, there's something intoxicating about winning an argument, I think. Maybe that's yep. just my my weird personality type. But, no, not at all. No, okay. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Okay. I hope I hope that's useful. Read these articles, especially that last one. I think it starts to illuminate a lot of what you see in politics, on social media, for, for various reasons, but it's it's insightful that, that humans can be this way. So we'll leave it there. We'll be back next week for episode two. I, I'm not even going to give the number. I'll put it, I'll put it. <laughs> I just lost track. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> uh, follow, right. follow us on Twitter in the meantime, at Dr. Liza Dunn, MD, at Cam J English, at Genetic Literacy for the Genetic Literacy Project. They put this all on for us, as I am fond of saying. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Have a good week. <laughs>